It is late 1940, and the United States is enjoying life as a neutral country, while the rest of the world is fighting a growing conflict which will soon become a world war. Americans are aware of this turmoil on the horizon, yet remain neutral against joining the war. However, some Americans feel the United States will soon join the fight and decide to enlist now. One of these young Americans is a 20-year-old college graduate named John Stewart. And instead of pursuing a teaching career, he decides to join the United States Navy. I uh, had a teaching degree, and this may sound absurd, but I applied to three high schools to teach. The highest offer I had was $85 a month. Which sounds like that's babysitting money now, but... And so the Navy at that time was offering a bonus if you would fly. And you started out at 75 a month. And once you learned to fly, like with instructing, you paid 120 a month. It's a matter of sheer survival and finance that I got into it. John Stewart makes a decision and enlists in the Navy Air Corps where he will be trained as a pilot. It was pretty obvious that we were going to be in the war because we the European War. So primarily I joined because war was coming and I'd just well be in. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, United States of America 
was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. I believe that I interpret the will of the Congress and of the people when I assert that we will not only defend ourselves to the uttermost, but will make it very certain that this form of treachery shall never again and dangerous. After the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, the United States' idea of isolation is shattered. No longer can America sit on the sidelines. The distant war has finally reached home. You mean animosity? You, you better believe it. Uh, it was a, when I was general, nothing unique about it being in the service. Uh, it was the same feeling everybody had was just absolute outrage. And I suppose, be honest, a hatred towards, I don't I wouldn't necessarily say it was the Japanese people as much as the Japanese government. After pilot training in Kansas City, Missouri and Pensacola, Florida, John is promoted to pilot instructor for the many new pilots flooding into the Navy. I instructed in, in flying for uh, 1941 and 1942 after the war had started. And then I went to the Pacific and uh, action was in the Marianas, North, North Mariana Islands of Saipan. In America's Midwest, another young man named Dean Summers is living with his family in Chanute, Kansas, where effects of the Great Depression are still being felt. Basically, well, I was working part-time uh, carrying groceries. If I may, of course, I was raised on the farm, and the Depression years, things got so bad. Dad finally found a job in Chanute. And in September of 41, we moved there. As I went to work at the carrying groceries and carried ice for a while. Um, that's why I was going to actually put in the service in that following May or June of 42. In the following spring of 1942, Dean is called for his physical examination and is classified 1A, which makes him eligible for active service. In May of 42, he is sent for training at Jefferson Barracks in Missouri, just south of St. Louis. It's quite an experience, of course. Uh, you know, Jefferson Barracks is an old established barracks there. 
But for all us newcomers, we lived in tents. We had to go through various tests to determine what how the category is for uh, for the scientists. And we were going about uh, after a lot of questions on about June the 15th, as I recall, they found out that, that I liked girls and they swore me into the army that day. Dean is placed into the Army Air Corps. Shortly after boot camp, he is sent with his group to an airplane mechanics school in Chicago. And of course, you know, for this uh, Texas farm boy going to Chicago back there, that was quite an experience. Because I'd never been any further away from home, basically, than Kansas City when I went up there to enlist. Uh, it was, uh, we were fortunate to house this in the YMCA, and we had a pretty nice uh, little room, a little uh, desk that we could work our lessons on, and we marched into the school down on Michigan Avenue about 10 to our boss. Upon completion of airplane mechanics school, Dean is sent to a replacement center in Salt Lake City, Utah. And that was right around Christmas time, so we had about a week of doing Nothing but drilling. And they had an assembly, and uh, some officer got up and had him up with this old pitch. They needed aerial gunners, and you would graduate as a gunner and a sergeant, which is $96 then, not only getting $50 a month in the left right. And some guy in front of me held his in it. I held mine up. <laughs> and they shipped us over to Wendover, Utah. And a nice base there. However, the Scunnery School was up an old CC camp up north of Window, and 12 miles up in the parade. And so that's where we did our Scunnery School training. It is 1942, and the war now involves every major power in the world. Europe has been in total war since the German invasion of Poland in September 1939. The war in Asia between China and Japan has been raging for several years and has involved the United States of America following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. In the United States, Men and women by the tens of thousands are now joining the fight. One of these Americans is a 19-year-old New Mexico native, Ernesto Jimenez. Ernesto had just graduated from high school when he was called to serve. Well, first of all, uh, we felt that it was our duty, but I had two older brothers and a sister who were already in service. I had two older brothers who were in the Eagle Squadron in, in England. And uh, so I felt that it was my duty to go. Out of the 10 in the family, uh, seven of us ended up in the service. We knew what it was like. In 1942, the need for soldiers was so great that the United States began enlisting every able American to serve. Ernesto is sent to Fort Worth, Texas for training. After attending training in Texas, Ernesto is sent to the 10th Mountain Division in Colorado. The 10th Mountain Division is then split into three parts and Ernesto reports to boot camp in Fort Lewis, Washington. Well, I had never been in cold weather like Fort Lewis, Washington was. I, I, coming from New Mexico, we didn't have any severe weather there. But when I, when I arrived there, when, when all of us arrived there, they, they had the worst winter they had in, in 25 years, at least that's what they said to us. And the snow was, was terrible, and we used to go, go bivouacking in, in the snow, and all I could, I remember it did mounds of snow under, under the, the top, under the, under the snow, and where the bedrolls were. And so we, we did not complete our boot camp training there because we were from there, we were sent down to the Mojave Desert to train with, with General Patton for desert warfare. Ernesto's group is sent to train in the Mojave Desert under General Patton 
for the invasion of North Africa. Well, you, you hardly ever see your, the commanding generals, at least uh, book privates, you know, where I don't see them. But we, we saw him because we were special, special forces people, what was called special forces in those days. Uh, and the reason I saw him was that when the, the uh, invasion of North Africa was planned, they planned for airborne troops to, to parachute in inland to disrupt ammunition and fuel dumps and communication. And so that's what, that's what I was assigned to do, parachute into, into North Africa. Under pressure and with lack of time before the invasion, Ernesto accomplishes only two training jumps before his division is sent to North Africa. After Germany had invaded and controlled most of North Africa and the Mediterranean, the United States initiated Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa, which would lend aid to the British forces fighting Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps. By this time in the war, millions of Americans are now soldiers or part of the war effort. Most men are fighting on the war fronts, so the United States needs citizens to fill other duties. In August 1942, the United States implements a program called the Women's Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service, or WAVES. This is comprised of women who would serve under the U.S. Navy and maintain Navy operations on the home front. One of these new women is 19-year-old Gwyneth Collins. I was a lonely child and I thought that it was my duty to, to join the armed forces. Gwyn's mother and father had both served in World War I. Her mother as a nurse and father as a soldier. So in July of 1943, Gwen follows in her parents' footsteps, joining the Navy waves. We all the workplace, Navy Blue was more attractive one than the Army. But no, those are the silly things that go through a 19 year old's mind. Because, and of course, my mother was in nursing clothes, because back then they wore long dresses and she graduated in 1960 from our, our hospital there. So I had, had, you know, thought she was, you know, she was go any place and take over whatever emergency or, or whatever was needed. And that's, I think, something that you admire in men and women. After volunteering, Gwen is soon sworn in and sent to boot camp at Hunter College in New York for wave training. They had us in certain regiments, numbers. We were on number 10 regiment. But we marched a lot, stood and whined and tried not to faint in the heat. <laughs> uh, they taught us all the rules, uh, or they, you know, as much as they thought we needed to know about what the rules and regulations were in the Navy, what our duties were, and the things we were supposed to do. At this time, the United States is engaged in maximum development of its war efforts. 
America must now supply two war fronts. No, we were just afraid that <clears throat> we'd get it ended right away. We, you know, at 19, we were very positive. So we just figured that we had to fill our days with winning the war. Because, you know, if it lasted so much longer than anybody could imagine. Uh, and of course, we didn't, uh, didn't care about that, but we were uh, afraid that it, uh, we didn't get our time in, but we did. And, and uh, although it was strict, you know, we had orders and rules, we had never minded those. As Gwyneth Collins is training in New York, a 21-year-old girl by the name of Mildred McCormick is living in Fort Des Moines, Iowa, working at an arms factory outside of town. Before the war, I was working at a hosiery mill and knitting, with a knit uh, hosiery. And when we took all the nylon and rayon threads for parachutes and so on, they shut down the hosiery mill. So I went to work at the local uh, arms factory where they were making 50 caliber and, and 35 caliber um, ammunition. Mildred is working three shifts a week at the arms factory outside of Fort Des Moines and also volunteering 12 hours a week at the local hospital, which is greatly understaffed due to the need for medical personnel overseas. After a few months of that, I decided I might as well go full time. So I went and joined the WAX, which were new at that time. It was still the Women's Army uh, Auxiliary Corps. Mildred attends basic training in her hometown of Fort Des Moines and is later sent to Salt Lake City, where she is assigned as a WAC recruiter in Phoenix, Arizona. There, I and two other girls, non-commissioned non type, were assigned to Phoenix. And the only wax in the state at that time were three officers and the three, the three of us, six wax in the state of Arizona. Children would ask, what is that thing you want? But anyhow, uh, I was there until 1942. Um, 1943, I guess it was. Um, and I decided that was too much civilian life because we were living in separate rations and quarters and eating in restaurants while we're in Phoenix. While in Arizona, Mildred and other recruiters are sent all over the state in an effort to enlist new women to join into the wax. One time I took the lieutenant to uh, Tucson and we were running late. She had an appointment. So I let her out and I tried to park. I would drove around the block. I finally found a parking place right in front. And we were driving this nine passenger vehicle. And of course that was strange enough in that time for women to be driving something like that. And I pulled up to park and the ladies on the street, on the sidewalk, just stopped and looked. And when I finally got parked, she nodded her head and not. <laughs> just like I'd really accomplished something. It's nothing today, but at that time it was. While recruiting in the northwest corner of Arizona, Mildred and her fellow recruiters stop at one of the Japanese internment camps, the military controls. After Pearl Harbor, the American government became suspicious Japanese Americans might be spying on the United States for the nation of Japan. The government soon ordered all Japanese Americans on the West Coast to be put in internment camps around the United States. The place where they were staying was a horse ranch, racing horse ranch, and this GIs were there in the farmhouse and in the barn, but the, uh, the Japanese 
were in the stalls. One stall to each family. And each stall had a tack room and then a room for the horse. So it was rather cramped. And they served, served them the food they had to, everyone had to take, go get the food. There was a table they could sit to do what they wanted to. Most of them just took their food back to the back to their room. So you can imagine the consignment that there was there. I felt very sorry for them. While Gwyneth Collins and Mildred McCormick are back in the United States, Ernesto Jimenez is on the other side of the world with the Airborne, preparing to battle Erwin Rommel's forces in North Africa. Ernesto is in a special forces group that are to secure locations and sabotage certain targets. This group of fewer than 80 men is dropped behind enemy lines. We were, we blew up ammunition and fueled up as much as possible. There were about 78 or 79 of us that parachuted in. And, and it was just far enough inland where we could uh, create a disruption for the seaborne troops coming into, into, into North Africa. And then we were supposed to fight our way back to, to the coast. But of the 79, 78 of us were only only three of us made it back. The rest of the guys died. This is Ernesto's first combat mission as a soldier and his first test in battle. His baptism of fire. To, to give artillery support to attack the units. Um, we were sent in with, with the infantry, the so Europe, basically infantry. And if the artillery is close by, you can, you can employ that for, for attacking or for defense purposes. When you go into war, your expectations, your perception of war, and not at all what war is like. But one thing I discovered very quickly was that you grow up in a, in a hurry. You learn in a hurry. And as this old sergeant said to me, you know, if you survive, you're a veteran. From then on, maybe you're a veteran. And the next thing he said to me was, you know, in this, in this army, when with what we were in, he said, you, you fight and you die, or you fight and live to fight another day. And, and so that's what, we were absolutely not prepared for. And there's no way you can prepare troops for that kind of an existence. But when you're in combat day after day after day, there's nothing you can do to train. Rommel's German Africa Corps are strongly organized and present a battle-tested opponent for the Americans. They were soldiers just like us. And, and they were plagued with the same kinds of things that we were, you know, we discovered that later. Because some, were, some, some of them fought well, others didn't. That's where our troops worked. Sometimes you, you fight well, sometimes, sometimes you don't. And we were caught, and, and when I really discovered that was there in North Africa, we were caught in short of ammunition, and they were short of ammunition. So it was hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And then there's nothing that you can do to prepare troops for, for that type of fighting. At least not much you can do. 
the special forces now, they do all kinds of things. But in those days, there wasn't anything like that. In July 1943, after intense fighting in North Africa, Ernesto's division is sent to Sicily. Fearing that Italy would fall to the Allies, Hitler sends troops to help destroy the Allied armies. For the next two months, there is constant fighting in Italy as the Allies push back the German forces city by city, house to house. House to house was, was the, the, the bad part of it. Any, any part of the war is bad. But house to house fighting, you see, one of the things that most people don't consider is the fact that there are civilians. They get caught in the war. And there were civilian casualties all the time. And that's the part they don't like. But it's not a word. The other thing is that there's this sergeant said to me, uh, buddy, war is not about saving people's lives. War is about killing. So if you help civilians survive, fine, and if they don't survive, it makes you feel better. And, and there are times when you want to quit fighting and you want to kill them. Sometimes they get caught in the middle of things and it's not avoidable. We must drive the Germans out of Italy as we have driven them out of Tunisia and Sicily. We must drive them out of France and all other captive countries. And we must strike them on their own soil from all directions. Even though Italy surrenders on September 8, 1943, Hitler commands his forces to continue fighting. Fortunately, Ernesto and his group are sent to England for rest and relaxation, where they will later train for the Allied invasion of Fortress Europe. is with the Navy Air Corps in the Mariana Islands of Saipan. He is a fighter pilot and providing air support for the American landing forces storming the Japanese occupied island. On the ground, most of I was doing ground support, which just means supporting the troops on the ground, strafing, bombing, rockets, paint bomb, whatever. You don't get close to a couple hundred feet to them and you're going too fast to see them anyway. The Japanese have had the most strategic advantages from the beginning of the war, due to the fact that their planes and navy had already severely damaged the American Pacific Fleet. The Japanese also occupy key islands in the Pacific they are using as air bases and defensive zones in order to protect Japan. Flying was extremely dangerous. Not too dangerous. Good today, but it's better. But in those days, flying was pretty dangerous work, and you were paid extra. Flight landing, you paid an extra half for the chance of getting killed, you know, which helped. Protecting the advancing Marines on the beaches from planes and entrenched positions is one of the key tasks of the Navy Air Corps. This task is made more formidable 
by the multiple numbers of Japanese fighter planes, including the infamous Japanese Zero. Primary task or duty of the support that I was doing was the troops on the ground. And when they would get held up by gun emplacements, uh, whatever concentration of troops, then they would use lava phosphorus shell where they, what they wanted to destroy it, hold them up. And the kind of work I did was going in either strafing, bombing, rockets, one occasion napalm, whatever it took to clear out the Japanese so they could go forward. During the invasion of Saipan on June 15, 1944, John Stewart is providing air support, along with his buddies, to the Marines invading the beachhead. He is flying an F-6F Hellcat fighter plane. Was the Japanese Zero was so superior to the Wildcat at the start of the war. Out the Nuber, out the climate, out the run, out everything. And they took this same Wildcat and they put a great big engine in it, threw away everything, and waited, and cut you down to four machine guns, got rid of most of the radio gear. And it was hot. It would, it would fight with the Zero any day of the week. And uh, that's what I thought. It looked like a, a wildcat, except it had a great big engine. It was a, just a souped up, stripped down wildcat. And they, they were great little fighters. If it was AA or a rifle or what, something got my oil line and uh, didn't instantly crash. I mean, I, if oil was cut off, the plane is smoking and it would start flaming pretty soon. And I flew out to where there was a destroyer about three miles out. Didn't want to bail out that mess and uh, landed in the plane in the water and decided to destroy it. States has been fighting on two fronts for over three and a half years and suffering losses in the tens of thousands. The battles are becoming more unrelenting and the stakes are reaching critical mass. Back in the United States, a 22-year-old man in Arizona named Lewis Darby, is working for a telephone company and is in charge of the telephones for an Air Force base outside Tucson. Darby, a happily married young man, has been working for the phone company since 1941, and in 1944, he is drafted into the armed forces. At the time I was drafted, in 1944, some short of men because of the war in the Pacific and the war in Asia, that uh, you could choose your branch that you went in. Or before that, they drafted everybody into the Army. Navy and Marines were volunteers. So I just chose the Marines. When a choice is offered, Darby enlists in the Marine Corps and is sent to a Marine boot camp in San Diego, California. The training will prepare him for service in the Pacific Theater. I had never been in this expression. It's out in the world much. I said, in those days, you didn't you travel a lot. It was a real experience for me to experience men from all over the United States. And the basic thing about it, gathered from a boot camp, was that they were there to give you training, but it was also to break your morale if possible. Night there, the sergeants came around and says, Now, if you're married, your wife's probably out with somebody else already. Things you left home. If you've got a girlfriend, just forget her. You'll be getting a Dear John letter. And just that kind of talk, you know, I'd never heard anybody debased that much in boot camp. But it was quite a straight thing, a real experience. 
think there was one or two men in my boot camp, a bunch that were washed out before they got out of boot camp because they just came all to pieces, you know. And that was their main object. Stress you out to the point that you couldn't be good for anything. And that was the place to do it rather than wait until you get to battle to do it. Dean Summers has been training in Utah at a gunnery school for aerial gunners. After gunnery school, Dean Summers is sent to Blythe, California where he is assigned to a B-17 bomber crew. In June 1943, his flight group is sent from California to Newfoundland to rendezvous with a large group of bombers heading to England. In Scotland, we went down to uh, an air base, actually uh, Alpenbury, which is north of London, maybe 100 miles. And that's where we joined the 407 Squadron, 92nd Bomb Group. And this is the 8th Air Force. That's where we were set up as a replacement crew. By August of 1943, the Allied Air Force has already made several decisive bombing runs over Germany. However, the German Luftwaffe still holds a strong grip over the skies of Europe. To achieve victory in Europe, it must be crushed. On August 17, several Air Force divisions, including Dean's, are sent to bomb several factories, including a ball bearing plant. This would commemorate the first year of American and English heavy bombers in England. Reinfurt Regensburg raid on August 17th is a huge strategic mission designed to cripple the German Luftwaffe. A combined effort of 16 bomb groups and 376 bombers will carry out this attack. The bombers are split into two groups to divide the German planes. However, a change in weather prevents one of the bomber groups from taking off for over three hours. This gives the German Air Force enough time to rearm, refuel, and attack both groups separately. Regensburg and bomb aircraft factory there. 
And they, in turn, would go on to Africa by us following up. We were supposed to be close enough together. They thought they'd split up all the enemy aircraft. Them. But as such, the first division, about three or four hours late, getting started that morning. And then all the enemy fighters had, had time to go down and refuel and come up. So we, we had to fight them all the way in and out. 60 bombers were lost that day, 60 B-17s, that's 600 men were shot down. Dean's bomber group have been on continual bombing missions throughout Europe. And in November of 1943, Dean and his group are sent on a bombing mission to Norway. The country of Norway has been under German control since German forces invaded it in 1940. I did the mission. At that time, the sortie of 25 was considered the tour of duty and be released or sent to another place or the United States. I think the division as well a good share of our crew members. And uh, this is 16 November. It's the bomb in the Libyan mines in Norway. It's supposed to be an easy mission. Not too much uh, uh, German fighters in that area. It would be very little well black, but we would like a good share that we would see you in North Sea again. Again, the uh, engine failure resulted in us officially being shot down and the bay around. I had never fired a high-powered rifle, but when 
when we took our uh, rifle training and test for scores, why right, the only points I dropped was on the 200 line, 200 yard line. We moved back 300 yards and 500 yards. And bullseye every time there, so they took me out of communications and immediately assigned me as a sniper. With a bad, no wind, and there three or four days maybe before they shipped us on to Germany. <laughs>